Welcome to week number six of us being prevented from gathering together as a corporate body for worship on the Lord's Day. By way of reminder, this recording or live stream is not a substitute for church. It's not a substitute for us gathering together week in and week out and ministering one to another and worshiping the Lord together. This is an interruption to what is normal for us, to our normal services, an interruption that is preventing us from gathering together as an assembled body. We are going through the trouble of uh, these efforts of recording sermons and putting out teaching in order to provide some spiritual nourishment. But this, these services, these meetings are not intended to be a replacement for our regular church services, but rather simply a supplement to sustain us, God willing, through these days until we're able to meet together again. Our hope is that God will use our feeble efforts and maximize them even in order that the impact that we feel as a body would be minimized among us as a church during these days. Let's go to the Lord together in prayer as we begin. Our Lord and our God, we thank you for the kindness that you've shown us in Christ, for the riches that are ours in him. We thank you for the gospel, for what you've accomplished through Christ for the sake of us, your people. You alone are worthy of worship and praise and honor both now and always. We pray, God, that you will use the scriptures as they are read, explained, and preached, that you will use them in our lives, that it might sink down in our souls and affect us as individuals and collectively as a body, those scattered during this time. God, we pray for those who are being impacted physically um, by the virus during these days, that you would minister mercy uh, to their bodies, that you would minister grace to their souls. For those who are being impacted vocationally, God, will you show yourself the great provider. For those who are suffering from anxiety and worry, God, will you draw near and comfort them. God, you are our only hope. We've come to you time and again, and you've been faithful. So we come again asking you to roll up your sleeve, to take the field, to show yourself strong, to put Christ on display in order that we as your people might see him and continue to live. We pray in his wonderful name. Amen. As we come back together this week in Romans chapter 5, we want to consider life problems and love poured out. Life problems and love poured out. We mentioned last week briefly, leading up to Romans chapter 5, in this letter that the apostle was writing to the Christians in Rome, the church in Rome, he had made clear that we as humanity we're all sinners. We've all sinned, all of us, every last one of us, the good, bad, and the ugly. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Paul makes abundantly clear. He also makes clear that not only are we sinners, but Christ suffered. He suffered for his people, for every one of them. He suffered and died, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. And because Christ suffered, we are justified. Each individual who believes in Jesus stands justified before God. Those who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, Romans chapter 4. They are the ones who are counted righteous. We are the ones who are counted righteous if we believe in Jesus Christ. This Christ who not only suffered, but who was raised from the dead. Christ has been raised from the dead. Verse 24 of Romans chapter 4, God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. 
He, that is Christ, who was delivered over because of our transgressions, was raised because of our justification. Which brings us then to Romans chapter 5. After making abundantly clear that we are all sinners and that Christ has suffered as our Savior. And that we are justified because of his sufferings and the faith that he grants us when we appropriate it. When we trust in him and believe him, he was raised from the dead for our justification, vindicating that he is God's son. And now it vindicates that we too are God's dearly beloved children. And then the Apostle Paul picks up in Romans chapter 5. We looked at verses 1 and 2 last week. We want to continue looking there this week together. For now, let's read verses 1 through 11 of Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we exult in hope of the glory of God. And not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations, Knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance, proven character, and proven character, hope. And hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who was given to us. For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Chapter 5, verse 1, therefore having been justified by faith. We noted last week this hinge point, the crux of the passage. This therefore is one of the keys to understanding the Christian life. One of the keys to living the Christian life is understanding and applying this word. Therefore, the results of justification, they're spelled out here for us. But so much more than just the results, or as we said last week, the consequences of Christianity. Salvation, spelled out by the apostle himself, described in its fullness and considered in its finality. Namely this, if we believe in him, our salvation is absolute. If we believe in him, our salvation is complete. We experience justifying peace. We're granted an introduction, an introductory access, we might say, into the throne room of God. We have a certain hope that looks towards the ultimate end of salvation, which is the glory of God. And we exult in hope of the glory of God. And not only this, the apostle continues in verse 3, not only this, but we exult in our tribulations, which catches us from a blind side, really, because verses 1 and 2 are so wonderful and glorious all that Christ has done for us, been applied to us, and all that we're experiencing as a result of having been reconciled with God. And then this, not only do we have this peace, and not only do we have this access, and not only do we have this hope, and not only do we experience this glory, but we're going to have tribulations. Great tribulations will likely come. But even when they come, they cannot, they will not rob us of our standing in Christ. That's foundational. It's why the apostle began with, with in verse 1, 
we have been justified by faith. We're reconciled with him. That's the very basis of our standing. Nothing can alter that. Because we live in a fallen world, because we ourselves are sinners, we will have problems, tribulations, difficulties, but nothing will ever rob us of our standing with Christ. Nothing can ever take away the reality of it is finished for us because of who we are in Christ. In fact, as we'll see here, not only can these difficulties in our life not rob us of our standing with Christ, they actually serve us to confirm our standing before God as His grace serves to supply all that we need to face trials and troubles and tribulations. Let's just walk through briefly here and see how the apostle unfolds this concept. We exult in our tribulations. Why? How, Paul? How does that happen? Because the tribulation brings about perseverance. And the perseverance produces proven character. And the proven character results in hope. And it's not just any hope, but it's an undisappointing hope. A hope that cannot disappoint. Because the love of God has been spilled out, dumped into our lives through the Holy Spirit who was given to us at our salvation. So I've retitled these, a couple of these, in order to stick with the alliterating tradition. We have problems, perseverance, provenness, and poured out. Life problems and love poured out. The beginning and the end, the first and last are the title of the sermon. And then the other two, the perseverance and the provenness, taken directly from our text here. Let's look at all four points. First, the problems. We mentioned it already. And not only this, but we exult in our tribulations. There are problems in this life. If you haven't faced any, you just haven't lived long enough. And not only this. Again, I referenced it already, but we read it and think there's more. There's more than this peace and access and grace and hope and glory. Yes, and, and, and not only this, our boasting is not reserved or somehow confined to the future. The last phrase in verse 2, we exult in hope of the glory of God. This is not just a firm standing now and looking off to the future thinking one day it will be glorious. But what the Apostle Paul is making clear here is that even now in the midst of this life, surrounded by the difficulties, in the midst of the situation that we find ourselves, we can boast, we can glory in who God is for us. The glorying in God, the boasting in our standing is not somehow confined or reserved for heaven or for the next life. But we boast and rejoice and exult now. In what? In tribulations. And not only this, not only do you exult in the hope of the glory of God, but we also exult or rejoice in our tribulations. When we read this first line of verse 3, it appears that the apostle is missing something. He's leaving out information, skipping a few steps. But what the apostle says here matches other places in Scripture. Jesus himself, days before his crucifixion, in the world you will have tribulation. But take courage, I have overcome the world. Or Acts 14, 22, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. So it's expected Christians are going to deal with difficulties. The way that we respond to the issues in our lives, particularly the difficulties that we face, 
reveal our standing with God. The way you respond to difficult situations at work, in the community, at home, within the church, the way you respond, reveal your standing with God. Which allows us to take some time and to consider what has your history shown? Do you simply respond in negativity to all of the difficult situations that you face? Is it your habit to simply grin and bear it and just press on? Do you find that you passively resign to the situation, assuming there's nothing more that can be done? Or do you just kind of grudgingly put up with trials? Look at the way the Apostle Paul says it. And not only this, but we exult in our tribulations. Not stoically, but hopefully, full of hope. This is coming off the heels of exulting in the hope of the glory of God. And he adds this, not not only this, not only do we exult in the hope of the glory of God, but we exult in our tribulations. The Christian boasts in trials. The Christian who is happy in God glories in suffering, exalts in tribulations, in our tribulations, not in spite of them, but because of them. This is difficult for for us to grasp. It's more difficult to live out, but this is the expectation. This is This is the grace that God has given us. He's given us sufficient grace to respond in appropriate ways. We exult in our tribulations. Not just merely in the midst of them, but on account of them. This isn't being surrounded in a difficult situation and just pretending it doesn't exist. But we see them And we praise God for them, rejoicing due to the eternal benefit. And this is where we, where it is necessary for us to include the rest of the text here that Paul is writing. Glorying in tribulations, exulting in suffering is the fruit of faith. We exult in our tribulations, not sickness and sorrow, sometimes sickness and sorrow, yes, but more the concept here is the pressure that we feel from a hostile world. How do we respond? The expectation from the scriptures is that we exult, we rejoice in the midst of the difficult circumstances and the trying situations. Knowing, here's where it's important for us to see the connection, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance. How can we exult in the midst of difficulty? How can we rejoice in the midst of tribulations? Because we know. Because we know what God says in his word. We know that he is using everything in our lives to conform us to the image of Christ. He's using it to put us on the pathway to perseverance or the pathway to glory, we might say. The the difficulties that we face in our lives, the tribulations that we are dealing with, they are the pathway to glory. They're the pathway to sanctification, the pathway to glorification. Listen to Luke 24, 26. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? This is coming from the words of Jesus, post-crucifixion, post-resurrection, pre-ascension. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? Or in the beginning of Christ's ministry, Matthew 5, blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The pathway to the kingdom of heaven is sometimes persecution for the sake of righteousness. <coughs> Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. 
Rejoice and be glad, Jesus says, for your reward in heaven is great. Rejoice when you receive insults and persecutions and evil things are set against you because the reward in heaven is great. For in the same way, Jesus continues, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Rejoice and be glad. Can there be any stronger statement from Jesus with regard to how we should respond to difficulties? Rejoice and be glad, he says. Acts 5.41, they went on their way rejoicing after having been beaten, that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. Rejoicing, exulting at the privilege. Or James chapter 1, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. This is almost an exact parallel Consider it all joy when you encounter various trials, knowing, James says, that the testing of your faith produces endurance. That's the way James says it. Paul says we exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance. It's the exact same phrase, not just a close parallel. We must know that faith put on trial produces endurance. Perseverance. So that when our faith is tried, when we face difficulties, when tribulations come, we know what God has said. And we rejoice because the pathway is being paved to glory. Now, it's important that we make a couple of comments here or a couple of considerations, the expectation for the Christian is not, is not to like suffering, nor is it to enjoy trials. That's not what the apostle is saying here. The expectation is to glory in them, to rejoice in them. It's not, come what may, I'll try to be happy. But it is, Knowing the truth of God's word, knowing the, the, the truth of his character and the promised result of what he is doing in us, we have hope. Hope of complete conformity to the image of Jesus. And therefore we can exalt, therefore we can rejoice. Paul is not saying that we should Invite suffering into our lives. He's not saying that we should enjoy the trials. He's saying we should rejoice in God because of what he's accomplishing through the difficulties and the tribulations. Philippians 1.29, it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. When we put our trust in Jesus, it's not an instant transition then to everything is just a bed of roses and life is a bowl of cherries. We believe in him and we suffer for his sake. Or the way that Peter says it, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you. 1 Peter 4.12 Which comes upon you for your testing as though some strange thing were happening to you. But... To the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing so that also at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exultation. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Knowing, Paul says, that the tribulation, that tribulation brings about perseverance from the pen of Paul, from the lips of our Lord. From Peter, from James, they're all writing in the same vein. In this world, we will have trouble. But if we're in Christ, we also have hope, a great hope. Again, Paul writing to the church at Corinth, for momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory, far beyond all comparison, 
I mean, just take a moment and this little phrase out of the verse and put the scales up in your mind, the old balancing type scales, and put momentary light affliction in one side and eternal weight of glory in the other. And watch the scales tip. Watch them tip quickly and, and, and convincingly that what we are experiencing now Yes, it is difficult, and it seems like it may never end, no matter what it is in your life. It pales in comparison to the eternal weight of glory. It is far beyond all comparison, is the way that Paul says it. Perseverance is being produced in God's people. Endurance is being established. Steadfastness and patience is being worked in us as a result of God working through us. The glory that is wrapped up in the idea that our steadfast perseverance leads to to undeniable proof that we belong to God. There isn't a greater glory imaginable. There isn't a greater hope for us to bank our lives on. Endurance and steadfast patience is being worked in us. And so we rejoice in all that's going on because we know that God is at work in us and among us. Listen, the same person, the Apostle Paul, who wrote for momentary light affliction also wrote later in the same letter that he had experienced labors and imprisonments, that he had been beaten times without number, that he had often been in danger of death, that five times he had received 39 lashes from the Jews and three times he had been beaten with rods, that he had been stoned, shipwrecked three times, in dangers from rivers, from robbers, from country, from his own countrymen, from the Gentiles. He had been in danger in the city. He had been in danger in the wilderness, in the sea, among false brethren. Spent many sleepless nights in hunger and thirst, often without food and cold and exposure. And he writes, this momentary light affliction is producing an eternal weight of glory that is beyond all comparison. How? How can the apostle do that? Because he knows that tribulation brings about perseverance. He had the trust in God, the faith to believe that what was happening as he experienced and lived through the difficulties of his life, that the the road was being paved, the red carpet was being rolled out for him on his pathway to heaven. Problems. There are problems and tribulations in this life. Perseverance is what's being worked in us as we face these problems, trusting in Christ. Thirdly, provenness. Verse 4, and perseverance, proven character. That is, a character that has been put to the test and has proven tried and true. The testing has come. And you've passed. The way that one commentary describes it is having a tried integrity. And proven character, verse 4, hope. That is complete confidence in God completing what he has begun. There's a provenness because God has tried us in a refiner's fire. And the dross has been slowly scraped away, skimmed off. We have an increased measure of hope, which really brings this back full circle. The end of verse 2, we exult in hope of the glory of God, but we face tribulations But that produces perseverance and grants us a proven character, a tried integrity, which gives us hope again. You can see the full cycle, if you will, that we continue 
living in the midst of, the trials that we face lead us again and again back to hope. Hope in a living God. Hope in God who cannot lie. Hope in God who is always faithful and trustworthy. And the argument is basically finished. We begin with hope, we end with hope. And everything on the circle is driving us towards an increased, and an ever-increased amount of hope in God who loves us and gave himself for us. But though the argument is finished, the apostle does not leave it alone. It's as if he comes back now and he sees the argument on paper and he pulls out a highlighter or an ink pen and he highlights and underlines the glorious truth that this hope does not disappoint. Look at verse 5. Hope does not disappoint. And, and what he's using here is a play on words of sorts. He's making a positive assertion by using the negative opposite. He's not at all saying hope's just a little bit better than disappointment. It's actually just the opposite. He's making an ironic understatement in which an affirmative is expressed by the negative of its contrary. He's attempting to make a much stronger statement than hope is a little bit better than disappointment. No, he's saying hope doesn't even come close. This hope doesn't even come close to being a disappointment. I mean, we can understand this. We could say to someone, if you make that decision, you'll never be sorry. We don't mean that they're just barely going to get by without having any regret. We mean they're going to be happy and glad and experience joy and exuberance as a result of making that choice. And the Apostle Paul did this in the beginning of this letter. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. He's not just meh about the gospel. He's very proud of it. He has lots of hope in it. This hope that does not disappoint is a hope that leads to results in exulting and glorying in God. That the idea from Paul is that for the Christian, for you if you're in Christ, is that trials and sufferings do not just not get you down, but they establish you on your feet. They stand you up and put you firm, rock solid in Christ who cannot fail. Which again begs the question, how? How do we glory because of suffering? In a world where there are so many problems, even when the problems produce a perseverance in us and a provenness in our character, how is it possible? Paul continues, because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who is given to us. Being justified by faith and having peace with God and having access into the throne room of God and standing in his grace and exulting in the hope of the glory of God. That is great in verses 1 and 2. And then Paul hits us with the difficulties and the tribulations that are there. But then there's the promise that he's working out glory in us. And, and it's really for our good. And then he tops it off, icing on the cake, if you will. That he has poured out, God has poured out his love into our hearts as individuals and collectively as his people. The love of God has been poured out, dumped in copious measure into our lives. It's a profuse gushing forth. It's not, not a little dabble here and a little dabble there. It's a filling up to the point of overflowing and an overflow of divine affection. God has lavished his love on you. This is the ground of all of our assurance as a Christian. The love of God. The, the way Charles Wesley said it sums it up well. O oh, love divine, how sweet thou art. When shall I find my longing heart all taken up by thee? I thirst, I faint, I die to prove the greatness of redeeming love. The love of Christ to me. The love of God has been poured out. The tense here is a perfect tense. It has been poured out, but there are continuing or abiding results. 
we are still experiencing as Christians the effects of God's love being poured into our hearts. When Christ took up residence in our souls, he flooded us and continues to flood our hearts with his love. Again, this is not a love that's rationed out a few drops here and a few drops there. It is copiously distributed into our hearts and into our lives. His love has no limits. His grace has no measure. His power, no boundary known to men. For out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth and giveth again. The love of God, no limits, no measure, no boundary, infinite. And he gives it to his people again and again and again. When God loves, when he expresses his love, it's a revelation, a manifestation of his loving essence. It's an exercise of his goodness toward individual sinners. This is the way that J.I. Packer describes it. His love is an exercise of his goodness toward individual sinners, whereby having identified himself with their welfare, he has given his son to be their savior and now brings them to know and enjoy him in a covenant relation. We can summarize that this way. The love of God is the supreme manifestation of divine goodness to sinners. There's no greater expression of the goodness of God than his love. A love that is free, that is spontaneous, uninfluenced, unprovoked, unsolicited, uncaused. It's a love that doesn't respond, but a love that compels and initiates. Listen to the words of John Bryan, written in 1743. No tongue can fully express the infinitude of God's love, or any mind comprehend it. And he quotes Ephesians 3.19. It surpasses knowledge. He continues... The most extensive ideas that a finite mind can frame about divine love are infinitely below its true nature. The heaven is not so far above the earth as the goodness of God is beyond the most raised conceptions which we are able to form of it. It is an ocean which swells higher than all the mountains of opposition in such as are the objects of it. It is a fountain from which flows all necessary good to all those who are interested in it. I mean, imagine the love of God as a fountain that is flowing all the necessary good into your life. Love is not just one of his attributes. God isn't made up of different parts. Love is his very nature. It's, it's an anchor in his character. And he only loves in ways that are suitable to the kind of person he is. He only loves in keeping with who he is as God. And he has displayed his love most clearly in Christ. When the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, Titus 3, he saved us. Not on the basis of deeds which we had done in righteousness, but according to his mercy. This is God's love put on display for mankind. That Christ came and lived and died. For God so loved the world. Here's God's love that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I mentioned Ephesians 3.19. It surpasses knowledge. Words fail us when we attempt to describe the indescribable. His love is unspeakable. It's unsearchable. It's inconceivable. I mean, we can know the reality of it. We know that he is love. We've experienced it, but we cannot know it in its fullness. We can't even imagine it in its fullness. 
We can know the spring of His love, but we can't measure the full flood. We can experience, in some degree, a measure of it flooding into our souls, but we can't measure the full flood of His love flowing into every soul for all time. We know the dawn of His love, but we can't gaze on the unclouded noonday sun of His love. It's too much to contain. We know in part, but we cannot know in full extent. By this, the love of God was manifested in us. 1 John 4, 9, that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through Him. God sent His Son into the world so that we would live in Him. That we would live and abide in His love. That we would live in the reality of His love being poured out in our hearts. Which gives us hope that doesn't disappoint. As a result of our character being proven, our integrity being tried. As we live this life of persevering faith. Even in the midst of difficulties and trials. Now there's a difference here between understanding that God loves sinners and us actually making our home in His love and abiding there. It's one thing for us to say with our mouths and understand in our minds that God loves His people. But faith requires us to rest in that love. And to live constantly in light of that love. Most of us believe that God loves us and sent His Son to die for us. And rightly so. But some of us may need to get up out of our pitiful makeshift shanties. And lay down and rest in His love. Recognizing that the work of Christ for us has produced a justifying peace for us. Granting us an introductory access to God himself. Providing for us a certain hope of future glory that results in us rejoicing even now in the midst of tribulations. As perseverance is continually worked out in us. And our character is proven even more. Resulting in a greater hope in the glory of God. All based in the reality of God's love being dispensed. Which sounds small. Dumped into our hearts. We're going to have problems. We're going to have tribulations always in this life. But for the Christian, they will always drive us back to Christ. For the man or woman of faith, they will always drive us back to the Savior. The blessings of God are often poured out in bitter cups. William Cooper said it this way, The bud may have a bitter taste, but sweet will be the flower. The blessings may be poured out in bitter cups, but they are blessings nonetheless. Because they're from God and because God is working in us and for us. The Christian rejoices as much in the present sufferings as he does in the future glory. The end of verse 2, we exult in the hope of the glory of God. And the first phrase of verse 3, and not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations. How? Because His grace is sufficient. He's granting us all that we need. Grace upon grace. Flooding into our lives now. It's grace now. And glory then. May God help us. As His people. To prove faithful. As we press on. Particularly during these days of difficulty. When so many of the means of grace. Have been taken from us. God hasn't changed. His word hasn't changed. May we continue walking with him, trusting in him, believing in him, hoping in him, resting 
in him, recognizing that we've been justified by faith, that we have peace with Christ, that he himself has introduced us into the throne room where we set up camp, as it were, and we live ever before a God who made us and who loves us, knowing of the future glory that we will one day experience. And because we know that, we rejoice and exult even, or especially we might say, in the difficulties and the trials now. Because they themselves are producing perseverance and proven character and hope. A guaranteed, solidified, certain hope in us. Because God has poured out His love through the Holy Spirit that He has given to us as a pledge of our ultimate inheritance by taking up residence in our souls, granting us life in Christ that we enjoy both now and forever. Amen.